welcome. I am here with Bust the Net today for a very special video. Uh, for those of you who catch my Twitch streams, I've been playing with a team in Denmark named Esbier, and our goal is to win the Champions League, and it's something that so far we haven't made a lot of progress on. We're destroying the Danish League at this point, but when we get to the Champions League, we're falling flat in just about every group stage match that we're in. So I enlisted the help of one of my friends, Bustanet. Also, some of you may know him as Delgit. And we are going to talk through my SBR squad, some of the things that might be going wrong, some of the things maybe that we should change tactically to approach these uh, Champions League games today. So one thing I will say, too, if you don't already follow uh, Delgit's channel, the link there will be down in the description as well for to subscribe to Delgit and his Twitch channel as well at twitchtv.bustanet is also a place where you can see him streaming his Palermo save where right now with Palermo, I think you're still playing with no attributes, um, except maybe slowly revealing them at some points uh, during the streams, but massive spreadsheet that you're using for tactical and uh, statistical analysis of those players. And it's been really interesting for me to watch as a fan of your content and as a creator uh, to see you go through that journey. But welcome to the to the video, Delgit. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I hope you will. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing well. And when I was going, I've been going through these troubles on my stream. It's like a lot of tilt and anger and like we're <laughs> losing games late that we shouldn't be losing to some of these bigger teams as well when we have a lead. And it's been it's been a journey trying to figure out how do we get into the knockouts? Uh, that's step one. Like you got to get into the knockouts. We just haven't been able to do it. Yeah, it happens. Man. I mean, like I just had a Champions League match where we were doing well against Manchester United. We traveled away to Manchester United. And um, I figured we could beat United, right? We, we were playing well until I just looked at my bench and I realized, oh, sheesh kebabs. I left the central midfielders at home. I don't <laughs> have any center mids on my bench. And I was so livid during the stream because I felt that we could actually win the game because we had already scored. We were leading one by one goal on aggregate and I knew that we could see this game through. And when I looked at the bench and I realized all I had were fullbacks, that was it. It was game over. I knew I was, I was going to lose. Fullbacks maybe could have played in the midfield. Yeah, but the thing about this game is um, there's going to be... There's a kind of a penalty that you pay for positional familiarity. So, I mean, sure. even though they might have their attributes, but at that level where you are an underdog trying to upset mm -hmm. the apple cart, small things start to matter. Yeah. Yeah, I, have, I know that all too well. <laughs> um, so one of the things I sort of asked you about to take a look at when you had my save game file is my defenders is that we're conceding a lot of goals in the Champions League and almost no goals domestically. And so what's the difference? Is there something wrong with my personnel? And so you kind of put my save through your little spreadsheet, which I'm assuming you can kind of pull up right now um, on your end and kind of talk us through, like, when I look at my team, I would have told you that Guacamole, a name that's been renamed by my chat, and Sinali Diamandi were my best two defenders by far. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you're seeing the same thing. Well, I'm going to explain very quickly what my spreadsheet is, so it's, it's no, just in case, do. because there are a lot of numbers, and yes, everybody was warning. I, I warned everybody when FM22 started, you'd better not let me come close to spreadsheets. And um, <laughs> chat, they didn't listen. They asked for a spreadsheet and the beast has been born. Okay, so now I'm in trouble. So I get, I'm get i hooked to spreadsheets. So when I look at... <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of numbers here. Basically, what I've done is I've taken the stats in the game. I've exported them into a spreadsheet. They We take a look at all the scoring actions, the creative actions, and the defensive actions in the game. And I plot numbers, right? So I plot scores. I give everyone, everyone a score. So I break this down into like a defensive score, a striking score, and a creative score. So when I'm looking okay. at your defenders, when the def what the defensive score does, it takes all the defensive actions, puts them into one, gives you a score for that. So you kind of know whether a player is a very good defender. And this has been very accurate for me because it's predicted the best defender every season in the league. So if my player is number one on this list, I know my player is going to be the defender, the best defender in the league. Now, when I'm all the defenders in your Danish league into this spreadsheet, Guacamole was ranked number four. 
which isn't bad. Okay. But there is one defender in this list who is an outlier because he is intercepting every single thing thrown at him. He's got the highest interceptions in the whole league. His name is Jan Orel Bisek. And his wages are actually half of guacamole. So half the price. There's somebody else out there doing a much better job. And then um, I think your other defender, Marcus Vinicius, who's number 16. I mean, I you're leading the league table at the moment, right? Yep. Normally, when I'm leading the league table in my says, the top two defenders in the league in this spreadsheet are my defenders. So, okay. so your top defenders are not leading the league. So you might... Um, if I was playing a tactical system, I would want to start thinking about, you know, what can I do? Because here, in terms of defensive score, I think Guacamole is playing really well. He is, you know, he's probably doing a lot of interceptions. His defensive scores are very good. He wins a lot of tackles. His tackling ratio is incredible. 94 tackling. I mean, he's, it's very high. And his interceptions are at about 4.45 interceptions per 90. That's Champions League quality already. So that's not bad. And that's your top defender. Your second best defender is actually Marcus Vinicius. And there are a lot of defenders between him and him. I know. It's like they, we are ranked uh, one, two, three, four. Guacamole is ranked number four. And Vinicius is 13. So okay. there's a big gap between the two of them. And then after Vinicius is your very aptly named. Uh, big Dong Wook from South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so he's he is uh he's 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 not bad. I mean, at seven point zero eight seven, these numbers are pretty solid. I find that top defenders usually are between seven to about eight. Right, nine is an anomaly. Yeah. I would I would probably sure. sign Jan Orel Bisek tomorrow if it was my uh, save. Maybe we will. Yeah, I would I would jump on him in a heartbeat because these kind of numbers I I've. I've I have rarely ever seen. It's making me excited. Uh, I don't even have your safe. <laughs> I, I'm looking for a defender right now myself. Okay. And then uh, we've got Marcus Vinicius, Big Dong Wook, Guacamole. These are your top three defenders. And then you've got Diomande. Now, Diomande, is Usame Diomande your player? Oh, no, oh, it's no. Sinali Diamande. Oh, Sinali Diamande at 780,000. Well, he is your worst defender, according to the numbers, <laughs> for some strange reason. Which is... And I know why. Very right, quickly, I can tell you why his numbers are so bad. Okay, now, Sinali Diamande, compared to the other defenders in your team, right? Okay, he mm -hmm. is, his interceptions are 3.64. Okay, reading the game, maybe it can be a bit higher, but that's, you know, that's, we're nitpicking here, 3.64, 4, you know, that's 0.4 difference. But where he is lacking is haters 1 per 90. Now, for a player who's got okay. a jumping reach of 15 and 16 heading, he doesn't win nearly as many headers because he uh, his headers one percentage is 80%. He's, he wins like 11 headers a game. Now, he's play, made 12 appearances for you. He makes about 14 aerial attempts compared to some of the other players who are making about 19, 20. Maybe the ball never goes to him. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, on that side of the pitch, he might not be seeing the ball. He doesn't seem to need to tackle as well. Um, so, I would say that because Diomande right now, he might be really low on the list, but he his interceptions, his heading, he's not, he's in terms of headers one ratio, it's only 80%. Now, the top tier players are all doing 85, 87, 88, 90% in terms sure. of headers one. So that is one of the reasons why he's, uh, his numbers are a bit off. Right, so when you're playing, well, he has money. decent bravery and strength too. Do you think it's because he's six foot tall? It, I, I've always sort of thought that only jumping reach mattered. That height doesn't actually matter, but maybe I'm wrong. I think height matters as well. Jumping reach isn't the only thing here because I found that um, I okay, I'm just gonna say it out right now. Jumping reach is very very important in the game. Like height, yeah. right? Fair. Height and jumping reach, the combination is a killer. Like, if you get a player who's like 1.9 meters tall, I, for me, I just find it, whenever I find a player that's 1.89, somehow or another, don't ask me why. I, I, I can't give you a logical reason behind it because sometimes FM is not logical. 1.89 meters plus high jumping reach equals super defender. Okay. <laughs> that's that's it. good to know. 
I don't know. We'll start working on that a little bit more. <laughs> I know it's so stupid, right? Because when I go into the game, I you know, you look at my you look at when I filter players, I, I start gay. Okay, they see they see this on the stream all the time. The first thing I filter, height 1.89. <laughs> That's the first thing I go for. Haters one ratio. Minimum acceptable haters one ratio for any player is 85% for him to be playing in Champions League. Well, so I've always been at my filter immediately is jumping reach. As like it, I 16 is usually my minimum, although Diamandi we bought very early on in the save. It's like he is the best we could do. Um, but you like, for instance, you said Vinicius is my second best defender. And that's interesting because Vinicius is six foot four with 17 jumping reach. Yep. So I don't know what that translates into centimeters, but it probably hits your threshold. You can see it on your spreadsheet, the centimeter readout. I can't because I'm in the one nine four. Stupid, yeah, see, so Vinicius is is a big boy, and you're saying he's second best. So but that's, you see, that's interesting. But if I look at my spreadsheet, right, and I were to look at the defensive score, I'm sorry, let me just adjust all the defensive scores again for the best and the worst, right? So... Mm-hmm. So if you're looking, if you're looking at consistency, then you look at a lot of appearances, and you find that most of the players are one eight nine, one eight nine, one eight six, one eight six, one eight six is probably the best we've got. Like Junior Ajayi in Nigerian is about one point eight five. Yep. That's he's not bad as well, but you know that is a that is also another outlier. So he's yeah. So I would just say that your Diamande, Sinali Diamande isn't isn't yeah, he's he's just not winning enough hitters for him to be champion, you know, great. So if I were to set up a tactic, right, with him in mind, I would probably mm-hmm. just go and set him up in a system where I make sure that that side of the pitch where he's playing doesn't have an attack duty. Okay. Because so I could put the uh, Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Like a like a DLP in front of him or a box to box in front of him, not exactly. even box to box, right? DLP, yeah, yeah. DLP, most likely DLP. There's a DLP in front of him because if I put a center midfielder on attack in front of him, the center midfielder is going to run, right? So he's going to attack. So whenever the, there's a transition and the ball comes over the top, Diamandi is going to go for the ball. What if he's one to one with a player who's got better jumping reach than him? Then mm-hmm. he might have a problem. But it'll be sure. for certain matches if I were playing him. I mean, his anticipation is good, right? His anticipation is good. His concentration is 13, which isn't that bad. His position is 13. It's okay. I would always be paying more attention to him when he's playing the game. That's about it. Yeah, so just be careful whenever he's playing, making sure that that's how the pitch doesn't, you know, overexpose you in terms of, you know, a lack of jumping reach or hitting. No, that makes a ton of sense. And that's like something I never would have seen just because on paper, he's so well-rounded and his physicals are so are decent that I'm just like, oh, Diamandi's great. But, you know, now that you kind of like are going deeper into the numbers and talking to me a little bit more about how height does matter, it's not just jumping reach. Um, I I am con- definitely considering changing kind of how the midfield shapes up in front of Diamandi now, because I, I think we probably still have to use him a lot, at least until we could sell him because he is assigned as an important player and he's like a highly influential player in the locker room. Um, it's one of my more expensive wage outlays for the defense. So like he's got to get game time for sure, but maybe I can hide him a little better in some of those Champions League games too, or bench him in the Champions League, but play him in the league. Like he's, he's not, got definitely have some things to think about. I mean, on paper, I mean, just looking at the numbers, right? He's not not that bad, but he's definitely better than another player in your team called uh, Hammerhaj. This yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. This guy, if I look at if I look at my spreadsheet, right? Hammerhaj is easily. Let me go. Man. He's like right at the bottom. Yeah, he's like towards the bottom. Mm-hmm. He's like he's like, for a team that's playing. Your team is top. This Hammerhaj is like number 36 on my list. He started 11 games in the league too. Yeah, and his defensive score is the worst. in Among all your defenders right now, don't play with him if you want to win games. That's basically it. Okay, but he that, that'll make my chat so sad because he is uh one of the a fan favorite because he's one of our first ever youth intake players. Like he okay. came through our intake, we've been developing him to the point where he's at now. Um, hey, so. look. I, it's gonna make people sad. No, no, no. But we, I, I you know we, we 
see, this is not what we do here. We do our best to see, see how we can develop players. Now, I'm looking at the development of your players since he's been at the club. It's been amazing, right? So, mm -hmm. just looking at his development alone tells me that you don't want to you don't want to drop somebody just because of that. Because I have young players as well, like 20 years old, please. You know, I've got a, by by that, by that, little, um, if we were to do that to all the players, youth players will never develop. So, okay, well, he can. I don't mean to inter cut you off, but what's the problem with him then? Is it nine aggression? Is it the only 12 positioning? Because like he does, he has good, decent anticipation, good concentration, good decisions. Like six foot one with only fifteen jumping reach is like okay, but it's not great. Okay. But like you know, fifteen tackling, fourteen marking. Like he's got a lot of good attributes for a twenty year old. In terms of interceptions, two point eight nine per ninety, right? So this boy, mm -hmm. this boy, in terms of interceptions, he's a bit on the weak side. Hitters one ratio is about eleven point five eight. Again, a bit on the weak side. So I would say that he needs to up his game in terms of uh, the ability to read the play. We'll try and leave this and kind of move on to the tactic. But so my my takeaway is if I'm playing a team on the road that is better than me, my back three, according to you, with your spreadsheet, should be uh, Marcus Venezius, Guacamole, and Big Dong Wook. Yep. That should be the those are the three best defenders on your scale. You don't leave home without Big Dong. All right. Well, let's take a look at the tactic. The slot two tactic is the main tactic that I play. And it's one that we've talked about a similar tactic on the Total Tactics video series as well, early on in the in, in the series. Um, and it's one that when we were chatting before the recording, that you had some interesting takes on. Um with the especially that right hand side, so you, you're wh where do you see some of the the weaknesses of this tactic? Because it's done extremely well for us, um, and has been something that in the league and and in some Europa Cup games and stuff too has been very effective. But like you talked about some weaknesses, so let me kind of run through some of those, and maybe we can make some tweaks here before the next game that I'm able to play in the league. Have you used Diomande in this tactic? Yeah, Diamandi right now, Diamandi in the slot two tactic plays the right sided ball playing defender. This tactic will uncover his weaknesses in a heartbeat because the CM on attack, when he punches forward, requires a ball playing defender to bring the ball out of defense and he, he needs to be able to be confident bringing the ball out. When you have a roaming role in front, he might not be dropping deep. So I don't know if he's dropping deep or not. But when this happens, during the transitions on the right side, I mean, the right side is actually an exceptionally nice side to build overloads on because as the inverter wingback comes inside, CM attack runs uh, up the pitch, he could he could actually cross, these two roles could actually cross over at times. And then you've got a track mm -hmm. with dropping deep. There's a lot of um, chances of interplay here. Uh, mm -hmm. And because the inverted wing back, the thing about football manager is this: players go into spaces that are not occupied. So if the flank is free, the inverted wing back goes down the flank. You get very good transitions, and you can create plenty of goal scoring opportunities for the advance forward. Great, but in order for all that to work, the ball playing defender has got to be a top defender. He's got to be mm -hmm. very, very good. He's got to be able to intercept, anticipate, and bring the ball forward. Because when the CM and attack goes forward, the there is no one left to carry the ball through the tiers. So that is the only weakness I see in this tactic. And it will, if you don't have a solid uh right back, and the thing about all these back three systems is you need a very strong central defender as well. So you need to have these um Central defenders who have got very good anticipation, anticip uh, interceptions per 90. They need to have good anticipation, good concentration, good jumping reach. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, now we want them to be able to bring the ball out of defense. They have to... Uh, right. Uh, so yeah, the bar just went up, man, for these players. So so I would... And I love Guacam Guacamole passes that bar in all of those uh, attributes. So that, yeah. and, and a performance on your spreadsheet too. So that's exciting for us. Yeah, Guacamole... Right now, Guacamole, Guacamole is easily the best defender I've seen in your team. I mean, like, I would, I would, yeah, I would have, he would play in my team in a, yeah. Yeah, and that I would have told you that too before. I would never have said Diamante is better. We oh. just signed him this season too from Mexico, Mexico and he's been oh. amazing. So 
This guy, um, yeah, this, he's, he's absolutely sensational, Guacamole. Yeah. When you play against uh, Champions League teams that got a 4 3 3, right? If your CM on attack loses the ball in transition to their DMs or their fullbacks, then you you leave the pocket. That's why this right side is very vulnerable. Sure. That makes a, that makes a ton of sense. Now we will, when we set up for the the game later. So would you change this tactic or play the slot one or three instead? I would probably play the well slot one. Slot one. The slot one is interesting, man. It's one of those. <laughs> this tactic is is different. <laughs> like it started as the other one, and then it's like, okay, if we play against a team with a an attacking midfielder, sometimes that AMC role is giving us a lot of trouble. So, how should we change the tactic to give us a little bit more game against the attacking midfielder without sacrificing too much uh, attacking prowess? So oh. this is kind of where we, where I landed when I was developing this. And incidentally, this tactic does really well against uh, three striker tactics too. Um, so <clears throat> uh, this is this is this is fun because um, you know you draw teams in and then they lose the ball in the center and then you put one over the top and then you got poacher at once for a shadow striker. It, you can easily change your team instructions during the course of the game and drop world ball into box, uh, mm-hmm. drop play out of defense and you got yourself a counter attacking tactic. Uh, yeah, it's very easy to do. Just to drop. Drop two team instructions. Uh, you can change the poacher to a pressing forward and attack, and you've got a defender that puts pressure on the back line. It's not bad. I like this tactic. It's quite quite solid. Inverted wing back push, pushing. Um, okay. The only downside with this kind of tactics, and this is how I feel about uh back five systems, right? Whenever I play back five systems, if my wing backs are not bombing down the flanks, the opposition is always going to bomb down my flanks. And then the moment they put pressure on my wing backs, my wing backs can't do any business. Sa, okay. yeah. Really? Then it becomes a case of me playing with low lines and low lines of engagement, low defensive lines, and then hitting one over the top, and then you know basically seeing matches where the XG is like two for the other side, and they can't score a goal, and the XG for me is zero point seven, but I only had one chance, and it ended up in the back of the net, and I yeah, the game. of course, of course. Uh, yeah. So that's the kind of football I'm going <clears> to <throat> produce. So this is similar in the sense that it makes me feel that way. So I. I would go a bit more to your third tactic, which is the one that you have, the 5 2 one two wing-back attack. Because this tactic has got a DLP in the whole position slot. A CM on mm-hmm. attack punching through the middle and a wing-back on attack, which is a very left-sided attack. You can't... This this protects Diomande to some extent, right? You got Big Dong Wu and Guacamole. <laughs> uh, I gotta love your team, man. Okay. And... Uh, <laughs> and and then you've got the DLP in a whole position slot. It, this, this is much, it's, it's better in the sense that you could also, in some games, right, play those two wing backs in wingers, the winger positions. I would... In line with the central midfielders, you mean? Yeah, I would do yeah, that yeah. like a regular 3 4 one, two. And then what this would do in turn would be to... If, I mean, I normally do this against... Uh, Systems that are sitting back, like defensive systems, right? Like whenever uh, the AI takes a one nil lead and decides, hey, you know what? I'm gonna defend for the rest of the game. Right. Screw right. you. Okay. So what I like to do is I like to uh, put play wingers in these two slots, the winger slots, and then wingers on attack. And then as their fullbacks try to get off the pitch, they can't. They can't because the moment they play the ball forward, um, my wingers already trying to pounce on it and they intercept the ball. And because of course, because you got this player so high up the pitch, they can't even play into the middle because your shadow striker is saying, "Hey, guess what? I'm here in front of your DM." And then your two midfielders mm-hmm. are going, "You can't pass me too." And then you got suffocating two- them. Yeah. Yes, you suffocate them. So I think that there is a. I would like go with this five two one two and base a lot of it because things like you got low crosses, you don't need low crosses. Like low crosses is purely cutbacks. So whenever we do a low cross, these are cutbacks. I'll go mix if I were to play a like a game against your the AI. So I give myself more options. Maybe they'll do like a, a floated cross. They could do like a whip cross because I'm play, you're playing advanced forwards. Then you can go hit the early cross with mixed crosses. And then sometimes what you can get is your wing backs cross the ball before their defenders get into position. Um, so would you play on attacking against a team like Real Madrid or would you? what mentality would you use? 
I okay, the thing about mentality is mentality is just about risk, right? So um I normally start I don't know if how many people out there actually know this, but a lot of the AIs, uh managers, they start on very they actually some of them start on high mentalities and then they dial it down after about 15 minutes. I don't know if people have okay. noticed this. What you can do as well is you can start games on high mentality. So you start like taking lots of risk and you know, moving the ball forward. It's all about on higher mentality, your players are taking more chances with their passing, with their runs, you know, mm -hmm. with their movement as well. So if you score a goal and you're happy and you're lucky, of course you can drop your mentality down to positive and maybe even drop tempo. Mm -hmm. The thing I've done, I'll drop tempo all the way down to negative in some games, especially in the last 10 minutes, all the way down to zero. And then I bring my mentality all the way down to defensive and I leave the, the lines unchanged. That means I still play with the much higher line of engagement, higher defensive line. I don't change anything else. I don't okay. play prevention or goalkeeper distribution. So what that in, in turn does is it reduces the intensity of my tactic. And I noticed that your tactics, right? So whenever like I'm playing against these kind of uh, top tier sides, if I've taken the lead against, sometimes I want to go, hey, I want to throttle you. So what I do is I, even with back three systems, I play, I turn on the offside trap and I play very high up the pitch, right? So I put a lot of pressure on their back lines hoping to get a goal because I'm willing to take a risk because I've got three defenders. The moment I score sure. a goal, I remove the offside trap and I remove the prevention goal. Uh, I remove the offside trap and I remove prevention goalkeeper distribution. What this does is whenever you lose the ball, the the, the entire formation sh just moves down the pitch with it. You know, they move down yeah. the pitch with the ball. So they don't like try to sure. break the lines to win the ball back. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, small things, uh, you know. I've been playing the game too many years. I'm too old. So it's making more <laughs> shit. <you know? laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely a good... I, and there's little things that I might try based on what you're saying too, like just keeping the base tactic, but making the player in front of Diamant, in front of that right side be a DLP. Um, or or just not playing Diamandi there and playing Diamandi on the side where uh, the box to box currently is or on the advanced forward side. So that, mm. that Trek Artista, Shadow Striker, CM attack, like kind of triad can still, can still work. We'll just play a defender. That's, you know, less that has better stats than D than Diamandi does kind of behind them. Like we could play Vinicius or, or big Dong Wook there on that side as well. And, and either bench Diamandi or use him on the left with Guacamole in the middle. Like I, we've got options and those are definitely things that I could, I could try in that tactic. Yep. Sounds, sounds like a plan, man. Hope you do well and qualify for the next round. I don't think you're fine. I, I hope so. I don't think yeah, I, I don't think we're that far either. I mostly it's the timeline with FM23. The goal here was to always win a Champions League with SBR before FM23 came out. And I think we're probably going to run out of time, unfortunately. Nah, it's you, been a super fun journey, though. I, I still think um, you have enough time. If you I'm I had to. Um, I got knocked out in the Champions League knockout stages. And then mm -hmm. um, I quickly finished my stream. I, I'm still gunning for it. Gonna <laughs> one week. This we should be done with the next season in five episodes, which is five streams sure. for me. So that's one season in five streams. <laughs> yeah, and I I can only stream twice a week. So for those of you who are who are watching this video online, like you can catch uh, my Twitch streams usually on Thursday nights and Sunday nights in the middle of the night. For those of you in uh, GMT London European time, but um, I really appreciate you coming in uh, to talk Delgate and getting to show you off the SBR save. I mean, I have like fallen in love with this club to the point where I don't know if you've seen this um, on Twitter or if we've talked about it before, but I actually like work with the actual SBR club now um, through this save and through the publicity that I've gotten for the save on social media, where I'm using versus mode and exporting teams from the updated transfer database to play each of SBR's fitch fixtures uh, in advance and make a short one minute like video for Twitter of like showing highlights from that game and the stats from the game and how I did um, against their like real life opponent that's coming up. And it's been a blast. Like working with the club has been a blessing and I'd love to uh, get a champions league for, for SBR before FM 23 comes out. Cause that partnership has been amazing. Well, that's, it sounds like something everybody should catch up with. Yeah. It sounds exciting. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It's it's been it's been a lot of fun um, working with a, a real club. So I mean, it's a team that's 
they're not a third they're not a third tier club like they are a tier that when they in real life they were as we were in the europa league in 2017 and now they're in the third tier of denmark so it's been it's been a fun journey to help kind of rescue the club and uh they're looking pretty good in real life right now i think they're going to get promoted back to the second tier this season mm-hmm. but anyway uh, you're amazing. The the advice again has been incredible. Hopefully, we're able to take some some good lessons from this, and the viewers as well for your own saves. Uh, getting to hear a little bit of uh, Delgit's wisdom here on our channel. So again, if you don't follow Delgit, all of his uh, links will be in the description below. Um, his posts on Twitter, additionally, like his Twitch streams and his YouTube channel. Um, check out all check out Delgit on all those platforms as well. And I'm looking forward to your FM23 content myself. Uh, you're always kind of pushing the right buttons very early on in the cycle, and I'm gonna I'm gonna learn a lot. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to watching the show. Thanks for having me on. You please stay safe, man. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.